that I've been running my mouth. It's just what I do. Is it hot in here? No. Man, I'm hot. Okay, I can put up with it. I can. Ephesians chapter 4. I was blessed, this, like, of getting saved. I've actually been able to listen to several sermons on the radio Saturday. And this, this one here really drew my attention. And, uh, and I, I wrote all the notes down as I was going down the road, which is sometimes dangerous. But uh, at the same time, it done me good. I really studied on it last night and worked on it some more again this morning, which is another thing I don't ever do. And I'll hardly ever, ever, ever look into my Sunday night sermon until I'm through with my Sunday morning. Because you know why? I'm not smart enough to keep the two apart. But the Lord has done good in giving me uh, both sermons. So let's start in verse 1. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of vocation wherein you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, long-suffering and forbearing one in a Another in love, and say that good word endeavoring, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now listen to that again. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto me. Now that he had ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slave of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fit jointly together and compacted by which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body and find of itself in love. And that last part says, making increase of the body and to the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Every Father, Lord, I thank you tonight for this night. I thank you for those who have come out, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that speaks to us. Lord, that motivates us, moves us, guides us. Thank you tonight, tonight for the many gifts that are given to us, the many blessings, the many provisions. Lord, we thank you for being able to call ourselves the children of God, to 
be able to walk in your path, be able to know your path. Lord, just to be able tonight to be forgiven. Lord, we have so much. I pray that we are made aware. Lord, that we do these things tonight in remembrance of you. In your precious name, amen. Now, literally in this, this when you when I'm getting this, it's so many verses that I want to talk about it's impossible. But anyway, let's start right there in verse 16. It says, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, one thing God has always been really good at with us, God's good at everything, but you know, He does this for us, just like preachers preach, and, and they use a lot of introductions, and they use a lot of stories, and you know, something to get uh, your mind to be able to picture things. God does this also with us, and He does it through Paul, He does it through uh, many people that write in the Bible, but He gives you picture of that body, almost broke down into a skeleton form or, or how that body is joined together. Now, in the last part of that verse, he talks about that body growing. So we got a, a real good vision of what he's talking about. And, and we know what the body of Christ is. It's the church. Amen. And he is writing. He is speaking tonight to the churches. This is what this, this, this whole message is is to the churches, but the, the great part about this message is it's, it's to the churches that fall down on each individual. It doesn't just go to church leaders. It doesn't just go to the pastor. It, just, it doesn't go to just certain parts of the church. It goes to the whole church. And this message falls down for each one of them to make their decision. But he talks in that last verse to making the increase of the body. Now, if you carry anything about your church, you care that it increases. Not necessarily, I, I've been misled and misguided a lot of times on why I want it to increase. Now that's that's the whole part right there. Why do we want the body to increase? A lot of times I've been misled because, you know, it makes me look pretty good. When I first came in here and lots of people started coming, I just looked back there tonight on some of my calendars where we was doing 113 and 125 and 115 and 105, and then all of a sudden we dropped down to 87, and then we go back up to 100. You know, those were good times. But, you know, I kept up with that number on the side of each Sunday. Why did I keep it? Did I keep up with that number for, for just my, my reasons? Or, or just my uh, uh, calculations, or you know, or, or did I break the number down? That makes a big difference because at that point in time, I, I have a lot smaller church now, but I feel like I am uh, much closer to the Lord, and, I, I, and I'm much, much more personal. Because 105 or 125 didn't tell me to do nothing. You understand? It told me what I wanted to hear at the time that my congregation was large enough for me to be patted on the back. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I'm just telling you. I, I, I really feel like it, at certain points of time in, in my ministry, the numbers of our church, it, it meant if I was doing a good job or not. It's not necessarily so. And that's the point here. We want to see the body increase. Not just our church, but the body and whole. But why do we want to see it increase? Is it something, you know, that we've often said that when our church is larger, that we feel more energetic, we feel more alive? Why is that? Well, you know, we've, we've, stuck, we've talked about it a lot of times on Wednesday nights that, man, the more people that believe the same thing I do, it, you know, it, just, it just does something to my uh, the way I feel. We're edified when we come together. Now, that's why God tells us not to forsake this. But one thing we have learned is we can have a huge congregation that's not following God and it doesn't do you any good how many of you Or you can have at times where there are smaller congregations and you can get a whole lot more closer to the Lord than you've ever been. Church lines. And the difference is why we're here. Why do we want to see people come to our church? Before we ever knock on any door, before we ever ask anybody to go to 
church, we should have our reason right. I know I should. And that's what it says here. It says, you know, making an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself. Not of me personally, not of pine level, not of Jay. You know, I used to like it when I could go down there to those pastor's meetings and and I'm at a little old small church, and, and I had a whole I had a whole lot of schooling, and I could sit in there with those big pastors, and and just about have as many as they got. That's just how the devil works. But what really matters is why we want it. Why do we want to have anybody come to the church? It says to edify the body. The body itself. The body is Jesus. The body is the King. The body is the glory. I like to watch a lot of those medieval movies and, and, and I tell you what Rome is pictured in a lot of them and one of the things that they talk about a lot of times is the glory of Rome. A lot of the battles they fought they didn't even need to fight. A lot of times they were just out picking a fight just conquering more and more land. I always used to think about uh, Saddam Hussein Hussein what is his name? Saddam Hussein? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. There he is. You know, why in the world would he want more and more and more and more? He had more than he could cross England. Literally. He had more uh, under his rule than he could actually put foot on or ever see the faces. But it never was enough. Because it was about his glory. And how far he could reach and how far he could control. You know what? That is never, ever satisfying. You know, at one point in time, one night, all he had to do was let the UN in, and this thing could have flew by whether anything was there or not. I don't know. I don't want to get in that. But the purpose was he was so prideful. He wasn't going to buy a note. Because look how big he had got. It was his fault. The glory of Rome is not something you can touch. Wasn't such you could see. But it's why they fought those wars. It's why they fought and conquered people that they had never even seen Rome. Or never even had any dealings with Rome. And that same desire was the fall of Rome. So it doesn't matter how big our church is, if we if we're doing it for the wrong reason, we'll fall. It doesn't matter how big any church is. It doesn't matter how much money is coming in the church. It doesn't matter. I, I'm a, I, I think I'm a pretty good pastor to forget and take an offering all the gift. Wayne said I'm really touched in the hall. You didn't have your mind on money. I said, okay. But no matter how much money any, or or land we have or anything, listen, we can fall if we do it for the wrong reason. The body of Christ itself, now it doesn't just stop there, it says itself in love. We don't just do it for the glory of the body, we don't just do it for the honor of the body, we do it for the love we
that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Amen. But if you back up in verse 8, he tells you why those were given. He says, Wherefore he said, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. One of those gifts we talk about often is the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about that. But what he's talking about here is he's talking about what we just read. And I have missed read this for a year. Now, I don't know that I've, I've completely missed the mark. God deals with you in certain ways on certain uh, passages for a while, and then He moves you on. But for, for so long, I kept that as, you know, I don't think no deacon ought to be telling the pastor what to do if the deacon ain't never been a pastor. Same thing goes, how can a pastor tell a deacon anything of, a, of how a, a deacon should work if he's never been a deacon? And I, and I looked at that in a way that was saying, you know, some need to be the apostle, need to stay the apostle. He tells us that in other places. The ones that are pastors need to be pastors. But when you look at this in a different way, it really does a lot for you. When I look in verse 8, and I see that when he had sent it up on high, the Bible says when he passed the heavens, when he passed the, the sun and the firmament and the, and the starry sky, past space, in all of its existence, he sent gifts unto men. Now, very important, he's talking to a church. And he's talking to one single church at this point. Now, it means the same thing in every church. But he's talking directly through his vessel to that church. He's writing the letter to that church. Now, the great thing about when we see God and He writes a letter to a church, it means the same thing for every church. He patterns a church and He deals with a church and how He deals with a church, He uses that for an example for the other church. The other church should look and say, well, we need to line up to what He told that church. But He's speaking, and this is really, I really like this, He is speaking directly to this church. And He says, when Christ was ascended above the heavens, He sent unto men gifts. Gifts. Now think about that. Amen. Now think about why when He talks about the captivity captive, this is the conquering that He had accomplished. Listen, he, he's talking to the church and he said, Listen, I have conquered what has held you in captivity. I have conquered Satan. I have conquered sin. And I have conquered death. So don't, no more, I can't do because I'm in bondage. Because that excuse doesn't apply anymore. You, are come, you have the ability now to come out bondage and receive your gift. Now listen, the gifts he give is told to us in verse 11. He took men and made men more than just men. That's what he did. He gave gifts the ability to be more than just a regular average man. You say, well I don't understand that. Well God made just made it. And when He gives you a gift to be on top of that or, 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 or to, to grow you, He makes you more than your former self. I can tell you I'm more than my former self before I received the gifts of Jesus Christ. So much more because of just the realization of the truth of Jesus Christ that is in me. This may be different than the average man that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Because I live for a higher purpose than man. Do you understand that? We have a reason to get up in the morning. Now, he says what the gifts is. In verse 11 he says, Listen, I gave to the church some apostles. And I gave to the church some prophets. 
and I gave to the church some evangelists, and I gave to the church some pastors, and I gave to the church some teachers. 